let's look some more at the inverse function theorem. I want to actually now come to the statement of the theorem, although we're not going to, we're going to work towards it a little bit. Uh, so we have u in Rn is open, and we have f from u. Now, usually we'd be considering Rm here, but we know that there's no chance, and I'll talk about this a little more specifically later, there's no chance that this is going to be invertible unless the uh, domain dimension and the, and the codomain dimension are equal. And we definitely are going to assume it's, in, it's differentiable. This is definitely a theorem about what do derivatives tell you about inverting a function. And we're, we're going to see is it has to be continuously differentiable. So C1 means that one derivative, or all first derivatives, in other words, all first partials, continuously differentiable. All those first part of partials need to be continuous. And that's pretty much kind of a technical hypothesis. Um, and so I'm not going to focus on that. It, just about any presentation of the inverse function theorem is going to show you a counterexample where it's not C1. Um, but I want to I want to kind of focus on the other things. But we'll see from from at various points in the proof. But I think three points in the proof really we're going to see this come in. So uh, here's the first question: Can we conclude conclude that f is oh huh, and of course we still need one more hypothesis so we're going to assume that the derivative of f is invertible usually you'll see this stated as it's invertible at exactly one point or at least one point and then you'll get a local conclusion around that point i'm going to state a little bit differently i'm going to assume df is invertible on all of you and we'll see at the very end how this is really equivalent to um, the the state the usual statement. So the the basic idea is we're gonna wherever this derivative is nice, the function is gonna be nice in the sense we want. So um, can we conclude? So we know that infinitesimally to first order in terms of derivatives, it's invertible. Can we conclude? that f is invertible and does it have an inverse function on all of you? And the answer is no for a super important reason. It's the difference between a local condition and a global condition. This is something again I'm not going to focus on a lot even though it's incredibly interesting and fundamental <clears throat> but mainly because most books will focus on this. Uh, so the classic example or one classic example, and I'll give you two, um, is from R2 to R2. This is a super important example. And it's f of uv. I'll write them as column vectors, as, for example, Schifrin often does to emphasize keeping things straight with rows and columns. e to the u cosine v is the first output. e to the u sine v is the second output. Okay. And if that looks somewhat familiar, I hope so. I hope it might. I'll explain why you, anyone would come up with this function. It's the most important function in the whole universe, actually. Um, but let's calculate its derivative real quick. It's a matrix of derivatives. The derivative of the top with respect to u and with respect to v. And then the bottom with respect to u and with respect to v. We can see that's a non-zero multiple, the e to the u, of a rotation matrix, cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine. So it's definitely not, uh, it definitely is invertible. If you want, the determinant is easily seen to be e to the 2u, which is greater than zero. So it's particularly it's not zero. So this is invertible everywhere. Well, <clears throat> so this is something where the domain is all of R2, and um, the derivative is invertible absolutely everywhere on R2. Is it it's just simply uninvertible function. Is it a is it one to one and onto and invertible as a differentiable map? And the answer is no, because if you look at the formula for that and you look at the picture, let's see what happens. U constant curves where V is variable are gonna have a fixed radius. This is R cosine V, R sine V, where R is E to the U. So U constant curves, vertical lines 
are going to go to concentric circles, and they're going to wrap around those circles. So one of these lines is going to wrap around infinitely many times. Because cosine and sine, these are not anybody's idea, hopefully, of one-to-one -one functions. They're periodic. Okay. Now, the v-constant curves, <clears throat> that's where you pick a particular angle, a particular direction, and let the radius vary exponentially. And so they're going to go off like this. Now, notice it's not onto. It doesn't hit the origin because that would have that would require e to the u being zero, and that can't happen. Um, but more more significantly, really, it's not one to one because it wraps around and around and around. Okay, and that <clears throat> it totally makes sense that it can do that because remember, just checking that the derivatives are non-zero at a point or even in a small region like this means that when I wiggle a little bit here, it really does wiggle here and doesn't just sit there. But that doesn't mean that as I go from here, up, 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 or down, 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 that it can't move, move, move. It's, it's moving. It's not just sitting there. It's trying to be one-to-one, -one, but it just happens to go in a way that it meets itself. It just wraps around. So globally, it wraps around, even though locally, it's trying to be one-to-one. -one. So we're going to have to have some terminology for that. So let me make sure we know <clears throat> what really is going on here. This is complex, oops, this is complex exponentiation. If z is u plus iv, then e to the z is e to the u plus iv. That's e to the u, e to the iv, and that's e to the u cosine v plus i sine v. And then if you break it into real imaginary parts, this is the map we're talking about. So this is absolutely, without doubt, the most important function in the universe, and it's on its most natural domain, the complex numbers. And <clears throat> so it's a great example of fun a function that's very well behaved in our sense. It's exactly the kind of function we want to analyze. But it's not onto, and it's not one-to-one -one globally. <coughs> and that's OK. Um, it's just locally that we really want to want to think about. Let me just give you another quick example of the local-global distinction. It's really similar, but it's so it's so easy to do. Because um, we really have, you almost certainly have seen it. You better have seen it, or else this is probably not the right place to start. OK. Um, uh, let's call this rho. Depends on which book you use. Uh, rho sine phi cosine theta. And already, you're like, oh, come on. This can't be one to one. For the same reason. Uh, still, it's a good one to think about. Okay. So let's say, um, just to make this sure that, that this doesn't go really bad, we're going to say uh, rho is greater than zero. And let's avoid 0 and pi for phi, but have theta be anything. And this, is, of course, is spherical coordinates. We have rho phi theta space, and we have, you know, like a grid in there. What does that correspond to? It corresponds to the spherical coordinate grid, so like longitude and latitude. If we did allow phi to be 0 and pi, that's where the longitude curves all come in and touch each other. That is bad. That's something, if we analyze the derivative of this guy, it would actually, it would actually be singular there. Um, so if we avoid that, we, we avoid the places where the derivative is not good. But we still have this idea that if you vary theta, you can wrap around, 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 around. Okay, so it's this very typical thing that you don't want to, like if you're integrating in spherical coordinates, you never go theta all, all of r because then it's just multiple counting everything. Or it's very rare that you do that. Okay, so <clears throat> we want to make sure that we're not trying to prove too much. And so the conclusion of the uh, in, inverse function theorem, I'll state the conclusion and, and then I'll give you the, the meaning of the, of the words that I, I state in it. Um, so if f from this open set u to rn is c1 and df is invertible on u, then f is a local c1 diffeomorphism. on u. So I want to define that <clears throat> informally. It just means invertible with inverse being c1, but locally, not globally invertible. Okay, so we just have to 
um, we're already been forced into thinking about that issue just by looking at these examples and how they might be weird. So let's just write down a few definitions. This is going to be a presentation of the IFT that's a little heavy on definitions, mainly because not because I want to alert it with unnecessary definitions, but just because a lot of these ideas come out naturally in the proof, and I don't think they should just be thrown away. They're actually all good definitions um, and concepts. Okay, so um, a few definitions. So the global definition, this is the too strong. So we, we kind of want a Goldilocks thing here. Uh, the too strong version is that F, let's say, again, U to Rn, is a homeomorphism. This is a super important concept. This means invertible topological map, just on the level of topology, not derivatives. And so specifically, it means that its image has to be open if it's coming from an open set, as we're always doing, in, based partly for convenience um, in this situation. If f of u is open and um, f is invertible, so it has an inverse, just not to not clutter the notation, consistently I'm going to call the inverse g, okay? So that's going to go from back from f of u to u, uh, and g is continuous. I'll just cont, meaning continuous, okay? It just means it's continuous with a continuous inverse, although being careful about where the domain of that inverse is is actually going to be pretty crucial, okay? Um, so that's a homeomorphism, and that's the basic, basic this is a super basic notion if you're doing pure topology where you just want everything to be continuous and it's the notion of things being basically the same topologically. Now we want something stronger and we, and we, well, we can deserve something stronger. We expect to get something stronger. Um, okay, so we say F, again U to Rn, is a CR diffeomorphism. So diff as in differentiation, if, uh, again, let's see, f of u is open, its image is open, and its inverse, it's invertible, and g is, oh, so first of all, it has to be CR. Okay, so that could be C1, C2, C3. Its first derivatives are continuous. All its first and second derivatives are continuous. First, second, second, and third derivatives are continuous. And R equals infinity is included, which is an abbreviation for its CR for all finite R, that all the derivatives exist of all orders and are continuous. That's a nice situation. Okay, we're going to focus mainly on C1 uh, because CR isn't really very different. It's easy to get take what we're, we're proving and just replace the one with an R. It's just a tiny bit more work. Okay. But I might as well state it for R. So it's it just means a differentiable enough for your purposes diffeomorphism. If it's differentiable enough, and the image is open, uh, f is invertible, and g is the same kind of good map coming back, the inverse. Okay. Now, part of the point was that those are too strong for us. Okay. So let me wrap up this video. I don't want to make it too long by just. Um, making the local versions. Okay, so f u to rn is a local, a local, let me emphasize local, local homeomorphism if, well, for every, it's the usual say way you make something local. If for every x in u, there is a neighborhood, oops, that doesn't start with a b, neighborhood V uh, in sitting inside U of X. Okay, so it's X is an element of V. Okay, such that basically all that stuff works on V, such that F, I'll use a nice little notation, little vertical bar subscript V. That means F restricted to V, if you've never seen that. It means just consider F as a map from V new domain, okay, is a homeomorphism. 
So in other words, f restricted to v has an inverse. So that's, this is the key thing. f, when you restrict the domain, so you can take a function that wasn't one-to-one -one and make it one-to-one. -one. So for example, here, easy thing to do, just take theta and restrict it to 0 to 2 pi. Okay. And I want to get that out of there. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. And then, of course, we're interested in something a little stronger. Okay. F is a local CR diffeomorphism. If, same deal, for every x in u, there is a neighborhood, I don't know why I keep starting with a b, v of x such that f restricted to v is a CR diffeo. Okay. And in de indeed, both examples I've given are exactly local, um, in, fact, in fact, C infinity diffeomorphisms, the, the spherical coordinates mapping and the exponential mapping. Okay, So this is what we're going to be able to prove is true, simply knowing that F is already good in itself, going the forward direction, CR, in fact, we're just going to focus on C1, and that its derivative is invertible. So just on an infinitesimal level, you can invert it. That means you can locally invert it. And we don't have any hope that that would automatically mean you can globally invert it, because there's all kinds of interesting things you can do when you globally walk around. Okay, good place to stop this one.